Part of my reason for starting this project is that I wanted to have some more meaningful interactions with artists that um, were more in depth. And, um, you know, when you see people out at an art opening or in some sort of group setting, there's a lot of distractions and, um, you know, it's fun and it's nice, but I really enjoy sitting down and talking to people one on one and getting to know them. And, um, this talk with Joel Sacido, who is a San Antonio based photographer, was uh, an especially inspiring one, I felt like. And he's someone that, when I discovered his work, just like right off the bat, um, there's like a sense of his ability to to translate people's inherent dignity and worth through his photography. And he's focusing on subjects often uh, where there's been a lack of that, where there's often been um, a minimization of people's worth and value. He was a photojournalist for the El Paso Times and then has done freelance work for Texas Monthly and Texas Highways and then at the national level, uh, New York Times. So he brings this storytelling quality into his uh, fine art photography and uh, with just like a really immense wealth of like technical expertise and experience as well. So, and then he did a book called The Spirit of Tequila where he went to Mexico and sort of like embedded into the distilleries and um, went into the fields, uh, the agave fields, and documented the whole process and, and got to know people. And so on top of that, just like on a bigger picture level with everything that's going on in the world and as disheartening as it is at times to um, either experience things directly or um, observe it from afar and feel powerless. Um, there's there's a very like rewarding quality to his work and to a lot of things that we talk about in this conversation. Um, that I feel like restores some hope <laughs> in the world and hope in people. And, uh, w you know, we talk about, um, we talk about the artist as like being a vessel and a messenger. And uh, one of his messages I feel is um, to remind us all of the dignity that all human beings have and then there's also this whole part of it of um, trusting in yourself, trusting in your vision, even when that vision is fuzzy and allowing the process to unfold and to create itself and, um, and then reaping the rewards from that. So it's a really um, inspiring talk. I think you're gonna enjoy it and we're gonna jump in mid conversation. So here we go. Hope you like it. No, I mean, I think the very first time that we encountered each other was through that review that you did on tequila, but I, I don't recall where it was, but I read it. And as soon as I read it, I, I said, somebody's got it down. You know, it's like yeah. immediate connection in the sense that you, not only your writing style, your ability to, to convey, you know, thoughts in words, but also the accuracy and the sensitivity towards culture and the subject matter. I thought I was very impressed by that. Like Thank immediately, said, oh, somebody got it, you know, like uh, at all levels, not just at, 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 at the artistic level, but at all levels. And, 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 and that's, I think I remember I reached out to you or, or maybe. You I did. Was... Yeah. I, and it was, I pulled this, I pulled your book out. Oh, there um, it is. Cool. And was perusing it this week. And in anticipation of our conversation, um, and yeah, you you reached out to me. So the way that happened, I had a food blog, and right, at the time right. that your 
show came out um with the all of the photography in this book um I was like at a point where I was just sort of not really feeling that food blogging world and for, right. for me in terms of like it just wasn't fulfilling creatively for me mm -hmm. and all of a sudden here was the show that had this sort of crossover between art and food and I just like I was so excited about it and so yeah, yeah I wrote about it on my food blog which was um that's what it was yeah yeah and um and yeah I, I remember you reached out to me and I was very um like that meant a lot to me that you yeah. did that so I really appreciate yeah. that well, it was very special and you know in my mind it beat out a lot of other writings that I had read before and even after I mean it, it was just dead on and and um and very very well done thank you so kudos, kudos to you on that thanks Yeah, I remember um I remember writing about that um I don't remember all of it, but I I do remember that I had been coming off of a a project in my publishing world that was an English language learner project. And so of course, um Spanish speakers are one of the biggest um demographics in that audience for English language learner um educational product and a lot of the design was uh you know specific to spanish speakers and their countries of origin and it was a project that like was a uh, a revision basically it was an update to an existing product and the existing product was just like it was literally like a piñata exploding with all of these little animals coming out and just like confetti oh, going wow. everywhere. Yeah. And, oh, um, oh, cool. Cool, cool concept. yeah, well that was, so that was what was old, the old one. And the, for the new one, we went in a very different direction and it was, you know, when you're pitching designs, it's just like, there's a lot of, a lot of processes, you know, that you have to go through. Um, getting buy off from all the various stakeholders and it was it was a hard hard sell like the direction that we wanted to go in because they wanted to continue with the exploding pinata aesthetic and we wanted to be a little more refined and so when i saw your show it was kind of like um it was kind of like the grown-up version yeah. of of what of that whole sort of train of thought that we had all me and you know the other designers that were involved in that project were involved in trying to sort of um like remove it from sort of obvious stereotype right of, like the the really really bright colors and the confetti and the pinata and like which they're applicable but also um you know overdone probably and a little, overkill yeah 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 and yeah. your work had such a just like um a dignity to mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. like both in the subject matter and the way that you composed all of your shots and you know you worked with the lighting that um you know, I felt had been lacking in representations of, you know, all of the various Spanish speaking countries, uh, Central mm -hmm. and South America, um, the way that those are usually are at, at least at that time, you know, had been depicted in our mainstream culture. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, I do like, when you said that about like the cultural, uh, I can't remember how you phrased it, but like, that's kind of where I was coming from at that time, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. coming off of that project. And it was just sort of like seeing the, seeing the, the personification 
I guess yeah. that's not quite the right word. The like the yeah. realization of it in form it through your photography and your artwork. Uh, was well, just... you, you you do hit like a key word for me, dignity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm usually a pretty peaceful, easygoing guy, but if you step on my dignity, I become a totally different beast. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or my dignity or anybody else's, you know, family or friends, it, 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 once they step on that, because I think you got to understand that, you know, I'm Mexican. I was born in Mexico in Juarez, moved here in 64. I was seven going on eight. Um, but as an immigrant, I think you, as you can imagine, there's this whole cultural transformation, language transformation that occurs on the border. And, and you experience a lot of, you, you know, direct or indirect racism. Yeah. And I think I know my people, the good, the bad, and the ugly of my people. I, I, I know and the people that surround me are very dignified people, very noble people, very peaceful people, and very loving. Mm -hmm. And when they're categorized in another realm, then I lose it. Yeah. So everything about me in terms of who I am, where I come from, especially through the work, it it translates. You know, it it I I want to make sure that the best of us is represented in the imagery. Yeah. In, in, in whatever tool set I may have at the moment, you know, whether it's light composition or just the moment itself or or for that matter, you know, the picture that comes to mind immediately is is there's a, a himador, the, the harvester of, of the kind of semi retired harvester. It's an image, it's a portrait, and he has uh, agave pups. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that man you know with without speech without talking to each other we had a connection and it was a cultural brotherly connection yeah. he understood where, what my thoughts are and i understood his thoughts i under I, I immediately understood his path his suffering his struggles his his work ethic i understood all of that in in one look and he in return understood that i was getting it and yeah. in that, if you see that picture, you see, I mean, in big, bold words, the dignity of that individual. And that yes. was my whole objective. And, you know, not not all photographers can do that because it takes honesty and understanding and depth into the culture. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, they, they eavesdrop, they parachute into these cultures pretending to be part of it. But, you know, for the moment, they may be part of it, uh, but in a very, in a very loose way in a very yeah. loose way without you know in a very superficial way i should say yeah and, and for me it's always been that it's always been the idea of um as much as i can through my work to to reflect that dignity of who we are yeah i mean are there bad apples in the mix absolutely there's bad apples but there's bad apples in anywhere in any any, any place in the world you know right and i, I mean i I don't feel like any single human being is fully good or bad. I mean, yeah. even people who do things that I find completely abhorrent and that I can't comprehend, I still recognize that they're human beings, you know? Right. Um, right. Yeah, I think that I know the photo that you're talking about um, and and absolutely you see that man's humanity and yeah. and that he I mean there's a very there's just like there's a depth in his eyes that I think you really right. captured yeah. there's another yeah. one that um that really st stuck out at me that is uh, a man who is standing in kind of a contraposto pose and he's got like a I don't remember what the tool is but he's got some kind of tool like a hoe or spade or something like over his shoulder and he's looking uh -huh. down it's very much like you know yeah, david yeah. it's yeah. very like classical feeling do you know the one that i'm talking about i think i do and and it, it's another himador yeah I don't yeah know. it is yeah. yeah um and it's just like there there's a visual connection to like classical greek and roman sculpture that i don't know if you intentionally did that? Yeah.
That that is an interesting point because when I hit lows, creative lows, mm -hmm. I, my way of reinvigorating my say creative juices or my creative intent uh, is museums. Yeah, little museums, and I take as much as I can out of it. You know, color, composition, motifs, everything. I especially the classics. I'm 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 not looking. I'm studying. And I think if you saturate yourself with that through the years, it just automatically translates into your work. That's 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 how it works for me. I don't know yeah. what anybody else does, but for me, that's always been an incredible rich source of inspiration. And 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 I seek it anywhere I am, you know, whether whether I'm in Spain or Mexico or, or here, I'm constantly going to museums for that reason because I find it invigorating. Uh, and and the beauty of it, I mean, it's just absolutely insane. Um, and you you know, I think artists in general, I don't know if you may or may not agree with me. I mean, you have the doctors, you have the, the you know the city leaders, you have you have engineers and so forth, and they're all categorized, or they're all you know put in this pedestal of within our society. They're put in this pedestal of hierarchy, right? Yeah, you know. You're not the attorney or the doctor, then you're the artist. It's like, uh, you know, it's like, well, you're never going to make it in this world. But when you see these bodies of work, like I was in the Prado this summer, and I'm going, I don't, you know, I, I've met doctors that are, well, they're brilliant, but they're mediocre. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I've had some Creative. bad doctors too in my time. I was <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're just human beings, you know, they, they right. got the degree, they got the math, they got the biology, they got the chemistry, but they're, at the end of the day, they're human beings. Either they're boring or they're not as creative or, you know, they're, they're, there's a missing link there. And artists, like incredible major artists, they fill in that link. But, you know, in some ways they're, they're, they're given their due credit, but in many ways they're not they're by not, society. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. And, and and people are absolutely brilliant. They're brilliant. I mean, in, in the context of, of, you know, or from whatever point of view you want to look at them, they're brilliant, but they chose to do that in their life. I mean, take, for example, a Michelangelo. Yeah. I mean, who does that? I mean, right. try, try, I have a nuclear physicist friend in Austin, brilliant guy, but one time he, in conversations, he says, I don't get this thing about Miro, you know, Miro, the, the Spanish painter. Yeah, yeah. I don't get it. And I'm trying to understand what that's about. And in fact, he told me, he told me I'm, at that time, you know, when we were living in Austin, he was surrounding himself with creative people. He says, I, 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 my intention here on earth is to prove the theory of fusion incorrect. So that they're, they're spending, they're spending enormous amounts of money going in the wrong direction. And, and I want to prove them. I want to prove a new theory of fusion. Mm -hmm. He says, but what I lack is creativity or the concept yeah. of creativity, because he says, if anything Einstein had, he had those two worlds, you know, just by watching these two trains or these cross trains traveling, he was able to conceive, you know, the, the theory of relativity. And then, and then the math came afterwards and to prove it. Right. right. But the idea of conceiving that, through the creative part of the brain right. is the thing that he's always lacked. So right. he started surrounding himself with creative people. He says, I, I don't know, I don't get that part. I don't understand. My brain doesn't work that way. I think at the end of the day, creativity in general is 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 really should be nurtured more in schools, at least I think, because it is a it is an enormous element. And and for that matter, I don't know want to bore you here, but for that matter, like there's there's a great interview for, of Steve Jobs. I think it's called the last interview of Steve Jobs. And they ask him, like, what is the most difficult thing you had to do um, when you were starting Apple? And he said, I had to fire some of the best engineers in the world because they couldn't be artists. Yeah. And for, and for what I had in mind, I needed engineers that were artists. Right. And that's, that's pretty bold, you know, that's pretty And that's bold. why he was able to basically change the world. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, it it's a it's a balance. Like exactly. two things have to work together. Yeah. Um, because you can certainly be brilliant and creative and so ungrounded that 
nothing ever comes of it. Right. You know, it's the same sort of uh, dynamic that's in play with your friend not understanding Moreau. Yeah. It's just yeah. sort of like wh where's your where's your focus and where's your your natural sort of um, comfort level. Um, I mean, we right. all we all have that. Um, and that doesn't mean we don't have the capacity to like grow in other areas, but it's just, um, the amazing thing is he was open to that. He was aware of it. Yeah. A lot of people are not. Yeah. And he was trying to do something about it. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, you know, in terms of creativity, I think it needs to be in, in the general consensus of education is needs to be elevated to the degree that it deserves. Absolutely. And I absolutely agree. You know, um, our society just in general downplays it, yeah, uh, as as non important or non relevant. Yeah. But and uh, it's very easy to to come at it from the stance of like, well, I don't understand Moreau or any of this stuff, and be dismissive of its value. But that same person could be like, well, I also don't understand nuclear physics, but yeah. I accept that it has value in right. the world. Right. And um, it's that it's that sense of um, it's that sense of value. You know, we don't, as a culture, generally value creativity, and we don't acknowledge or recognize that creativity does exist in every field. You yeah. know, whether it's in um, science or um, food. You know, cooking. Yeah, or, exactly. Um, yeah. Like developing products that could save our world from climate change or whatever or um creativity and peace negotiations like you know no, it's not exactly that okay well, let me ask you about um you know to go back to what you were saying earlier about how you know you're a pretty peaceful guy and then but if somebody steps on on you or your culture or your, your, you know, people you love, then that's when you start to get angry. And you talked about some of the things going on at the board, or you alluded to it, you didn't re really talk about it. But yeah. um, you recently, on your Instagram posted a photo that you created, but it's an AI generated photo. Oh, of Moses, oh. Moses parting the water, yeah. Rio, yeah. Rio uh, Grande. And there's border patrol agents like <laughs> chasing him down with yeah. their machine guns. And it's just like, um, it was kind of brilliant. Like it really was like a brilliant commentary. I thought on, um, it was interesting. It was very, very interesting. I mean, my son had just started, you know, into AI and creating and and I said, you know, what what software is out there? Because I have no idea. I'm, I'm totally behind the curve when it comes to this. Um and he gave me about two websites. So I I started exploring and experimenting. And then I found one that was super easy, right? It's just you you throw out the 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 thought, the idea, then it generates. Yeah. And I said, oh let, let's see what this is about. And it just occurred to me at that moment that was, I was, the first image that I did was the Beatles playing at the border. What would that look like, right? Imagine mm -hmm. how that would look like. And then I thought, well, what if Moses showed up at the Rio Grande and 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 parted the river? Yeah. What would that look like? And uh, and and I like I I I think I remember describing you know surrounded by border patrol or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember the full description. And that's what it generated. And uh, and it was an immediate, you know, hit in terms of translation. It's like, right. wow. Yeah. I, I hadn't even really given it a lot of thought beyond the imaginary scene of what that could look like in that era. And and as you can tell, you know, immigration is not new. Yeah. So, um, and, and how have different uh, generations or societies or countries dealt with it along the way? And... Anyway, it 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 was uh, kind of an initial fun project for me, but then I understood kind of the power of that, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Um, and it was so quick, you know, it generated under a minute. Yeah. 
is really really amazing and then that leads to like what 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 is my job going to look like five ten years from now or is it going to exist you know is it going to be relevant all of that it, yeah it, what's your feeling on that like when you said you, you sensed the power of it for better or worse like well I, I you know when I was in Austin when I had to transition from analog film to digital I was in that that time frame and I was really paranoid because number one I couldn't afford a digital camera and I remember the first one I got because at that time nobody would hire you in Austin all the magazines there would not hire you until you had a digital camera it, it was that moment, that specific moment of transition where they stopped hiring photographers that were shooting film. Yeah. But, oh my God, you know, what is this? I was paranoid. Number one, I didn't have the money. And number two, um, I said, this is really something else. It's like, I, I don't know. So I finally got the camera and I started, you know, Photoshop, the whole process of, of learning it. And I remember very vividly the first time that I used it on assignment I was really paranoid. I I was tr I could not trust that this was being recorded in zeros and ones versus film. Yeah. I so much wanted to just shoot film as a backup and then shoot digital because I did not trust it. And then subsequent, you know, conversations within a year or two years of that were that, you know, this was the end of photography. And as I started exploring Photoshop and digital I started realizing that no, this is just an, a new tool. Yeah. It's just an exponentially new tool. And then, you know, fast forward 15 uh, years and, and you, you realize what some, you know, photographers have been doing with this new tool and yeah. it's exponential. It's exponential. So it opened a whole new realm of creativity without really destroying the essence of photography. So I sense that this will happen with AI. There's still going to be a huge you know, human element to it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the Moses description of that. Well, who thought of that? Well, my brain thought of that. Right. You know? Yeah. I imagine that. Like, what would what would Moses do? Yeah. In the situation, you know. That's and, why I think I asked you on your post if you had prompted them the AI to put the border agents in there because. Yeah. Yeah, you did. Had AI just done that, I was gonna. My head was gonna explode. You know. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, there, there is still going to be that human input. Um, will there be surprises along the way? Very likely that are going to fool all of us. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a human being behind it no matter what. Yeah. I think exponentially there's going to be maybe in our lifetime some really incredible surprises that have never been seen before in terms of art. Yeah. You know? And again, I see it. Yeah, it's a scary tool, but so so is nuclear power, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it'll transition or it will translate to, in my mind, another very, very powerful creative tool for, for artists. Yeah. Yeah, I that's, that's kind of where I come down um, on it is that, to go back to what you said, like, the the feeling of like at that time when the transitioning was happening into digital photography and the sense of like well is photography dead and I mean when I went through art school in the 90s the whole conversation is was painting dead because painting. people were paint was painting dead you know oh. because oh. people were doing oh. video work people were doing installation um like more um environmental uh work and um that particular question like is painting dead has been something that's just like been a recurring thing in art history like at the advent of photography same question you know does this what does this mean for painting now that cameras yeah. exist you know um but you know here we are in 2024 now which is kind of crazy um and painting is flourishing and like having a moment you know so I don't have any fear that AI is going to completely displace artists and creativity because again it's that creative aspect that humans bring to it and that that artists you know one of the roles that um 
that we take on is like being is reflecting the world around us, whether it's intentional or not. But AI is now a part of our world. And so when artists use a AI to comp- you know, to create artwork, I I feel like that's a legitimate thing. You know, it's it's another tool and it's reflective yeah. of the world that we live in. And we're at the, you know, the infancy of that. And there, yes. it's just going to, we have no idea how, which, what, all the ways that it's going to go. There's absolutely going to be some uses of it that are um, not in the, the best interests of humanity. Yeah. And we're, we're going to have to sort that out in the same way we've always had to sort it out with um, every other technology. Yeah. You know, um, but um I mean, it, there's there's like some details, like uh, sticky questions around like um, like being able to reproduce an artist, a, 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 like create a new work in the style of an existing artist that amounts to that you know a sense. There's a sense of theft there. And, um, you know, I think that, and, and questions around intellectual property are, have been going on for a very long time. I think this is just going to expand that exploration of like, what is, what does that really mean? You know, who does have ownership of their ideas and their style and their aesthetic. And, um, I do think it's going to displace like um some of the definitely some of the more like menial tasks as far as like producing um imagery go but as a a former graphic designer (laughs) like I'm kind of okay with that (laughs) yeah I'm okay with making some of that stuff easier so and and it's true I, I have friends that are you know they have their own business let's say it's accounting or whatever, and they're already attaching those duties. Yeah. To AI, and it's saving them, say, it's, it's shaving off 20, 30% of that tedious stuff they don't want to do or care to do. Yeah. And they, they let AI take care of it. Yeah. And apparently, I'm not familiar with it, but apparently it's working really well. Yeah. So, so I just saw, so we're recording this on um, January 12th. And I just saw yesterday that Google had laid off like oh. hun- several hundred engineers that yeah. are basically going to be replacing with AI. I didn't read the entire article, so I don't know all the details of that, but it's like, you know, this, this conversation around um, what is, what does AI mean for all of us and our job security and, and our purpose in life? Like, what do we have yeah. to offer to the world if, if AI can just come in and and do this job instead of us, you know? And I think it comes back to like what you said about Steve Jobs having to fire a bunch of engineers because they, they didn't have that creative aspect in them. And that's like, again, that's what, like, that's what an engineer can, I mean, there is creativity in engineering. Like you've got to, you know, be very specific in that particular role but um i know i know some engineers that are extremely creative people and um i can't i can't imagine how that aspect of it could be replaced by ai you know right right yeah i think it's probably more than likely enhanced a lot of the ability of these guys that already are creative yeah and channel that through through ai yeah for better for worse i mean there'll be some ugly things around the corner but at the same time um i think you may expect some very incredible surprises yeah for for the better i mean i'm 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 trying to stay as optimistic as possible about that because again i I have had that scare before, like I mentioned with with mm-hmm. digital photography. I was seriously positively paranoid. Yeah. Like 
this can't be, you know, I come back with this card and it's, and the images are there and where are they and what do they disappear and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but look at us now. Yeah. I yeah. started doing image montage, which I never really done, but I started doing for fun. I, I did the Camino de Santiago in Spain uh, for my birthday, for my, for my 65th birthday. And, you know, I had different reasons for doing it, but I did it. I didn't do a lot of images. I, I didn't take my camera, but I, I took my, my cell phone. And it's, it was really, it was a really interesting experience um, because, you know, you, you go with pre preconceptions and so forth. I wish I would have had the new phone because that can, you know, it's like a 48 meg file mm -hmm. and it's a raw file. I wish I didn't have it anyway. But for weight reasons, I chose to take my rinky dink phone and, and I shot images along the way. And then now that I started kind of reviewing those images, uh, I started kind of revisiting that whole experience, which at the moment is grueling. All you think about is physical pain. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of time to think spiritual. There were some moments that were like very special, but the core of it is just grueling on the body, you know? Yeah. It's like this pounding of, of exhaustion. Um, so I I came back and then I started kind of reviewing all these images and, and I said, what's here and what does it mean? And does this translate to any way or form the way I felt during during the um the 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 walk? And I've been going to Spain oh, since 84 and, and I try to be there every year or every other year because I, I love the damn country. It's just a fascinating country. The people are, are interesting also and, and, and fascinating. And then I have a, a bunch of good friends. But um, based on that experience and the accumulation of 20 years of knowing Spain, I started kind of doing composites, which mm -hmm. I've never done. I, I, read, I never really explored that because I thought, well, that's not really me. But I felt the urge and the need to, to do that, to create um, some interpretation of that experience based on these images. And I'm finding it very surprising yeah because the ideas are coming quicker than i thought and in a given moment um i'll you know take a image with b image and then it translates to something totally different based on however i felt you know a year ago two years ago or three years ago in spain or a moment in time or an experience in time and then I just bring it together and then let it be whatever it's going to be. Yeah. So that's developing into a series without me even trying. Yeah. It just happened, you know, but, but it's tools that, that I have always shot away from because it, they're, 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 they're montages, you know, they're, they're two real images turn into one interpretive fake image, so to speak. Yeah. But it works. It works. Yeah. And I'm having fun with it. Uh, and more than that, you know, I think it's exploring kind of a, a unknown psyche within me that mm -hmm. has not really been explored or expressed. It's very interesting. It's a, it's an interesting exercise, put it that way. Yeah, that's cool. I look forward to seeing that. Um, I feel like, um, you know, when I was saying earlier about the, like, when you're doing science, uh, you know, you allow you allow the outcome to be revealed to you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you start with a hypothesis, whatever, but it's like, you know, you're not setting up your parameters to, um, to prove something that may be coming from your biased perspective. It's a revel. It's, it's a, it's a process of um, discovery and revelation. And I actually feel like for me, at least like, the creative process making art is exactly the same thing like very similar to what you described it's just sort of like you 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 just start playing and then all of a sudden something is taking shape and it's revealing itself to you and you're discovering things about yourself the world yeah. you know yeah um, like to me that's the whole thing like it's a it's a process of discovery through this playful uh creativity 
um, that's sometimes, you know, more serious and sometimes more joyful. And sometimes it's a mix of, of both, but it's, um, it's not, uh, it's not like a controlled thing that you're doing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And for me, you know, when you're describing that, for me, it's more of a, of an urge and a calling to create because mm -hmm. I cannot be still unless I'm creating something, especially, I don't know if this happens to you, but you know, the biorhythm, there's yeah. months where I'm incredibly energized and incredibly creative. And then there's months that are just dud, you know, like, like this past month was a dud, not only because of the holidays, but you know, the flu and all that. Uh, but once I, 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 you know, pass that and I hit the months where are very, very creative. It's like, I cannot sit still unless I'm creating. So there's always been throughout my life, there's always been this, this calling and this, this, this need and urge to create. So it's almost like we're vehicles of something else beyond yeah. us. You know, it, it just comes through us. Yeah. And you've heard this, whether you're musicians or whatever, it's like, I don't know where that came from, but it just came. Right. Right. It, you're, 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 you're the, you're the vessel that carries that message. And that's how I feel. I honestly feel that way yeah. is that I, I have something, I feel like I have something not necessarily personally that I have to say, but something else beyond me. Right. That translate that through, through, through that medium that happens to be me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes I, I feel a certain responsibility with that uh, on and off. Because because I am the messenger, we are the messengers mm -hmm. in our own way through our own talent. And if anything, when I started, you know, photographing as a journalist, that, that was certainly a big focus. Is like I wanted, you know, at at twenty three, I wanted to change the world, and then you realize that the world changes you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> in time, uh, because it is what it is. You know, it's it's rough out there. Um, but you know, I did I did ten years of of journalism on the border, and that that will, you know, it was a great foundation for me. But that'll shake you because yeah. you see the worst and the best of humanity. And I traveled a lot, and I ended up in you know dangerous situations and and black holes that I don't want to revisit ever, you know. But but all of that was a great foundation for what was to come. Yeah. So when you were doing your photojournalism work and then when you're doing fine art photography, what are, what do you think? Cause I'm always really interested in that line between like the practical pragmatic side of, of these sort of creative tools and then the just very, artistic you know side of it and yeah and people who who have practices that um are complementary you know so you know you for example yeah. are a journalist and um fine art photographer like what what are the what are the differences and what are the similarities like where do you you know how do you feel about the line between those two things or if there is a line well, you know, I've I've had a lot of friends, photographer friends throughout the years. Some some went to really good schools, um, and you know, art school in, in in California and so forth, and Chicago and so forth. And what I find is, at least with some of these schools, is that they crank out impeccable technical photographers, mm -hmm. but they have no soul. They don't teach the soul part. You know, where is the soul of this image? And I think the privilege I've had with with journalism is that I always brought myself, my background, who I am, and again that dignity into the scene. You know, because I, I I've I, I've had just enormous and incredible people. I mean, experiences that 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 even my kids don't know about, nor will they ever know. You know what I did, what I went through, how I was feeling. Um, because, and, and there were powerful moments of humanity, so to think. Um, but what I've always had, you know, I come from a very religious uh, upbringing. And at 13, I said, I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the church thing. 
Uh, I figured that out early in the game, uh, but I always carried that with me as, as a spiritual sensibility. Yeah. So I have photographers that are immaculately, incredibly technical photographers, but their images don't do anything. Right. And sometimes when I do, when I have presentations at, at universities, I, the first image that I throw on the screen is this cartoon of these surgeons around a patient in a, in a, in an operating room. Right. Yeah. The quote is like the, 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 the surgery went incredibly well, but the patient died. You know, that's the right. cartoon. And I said, and, and that's, that's what I mean is like, you, you may have like this immaculately technically perfect image, but it doesn't say anything. It doesn't yeah, yeah. have a goal. It doesn't. It doesn't have a message. And I think I've been lucky in that way, not only because of my, let's say, uh, religious background, which kind of, if anything, it triggers a sensibility within you, mm -hmm. the spiritual sensibility, and then the humanity of of uh, being boots on the ground in the trenches of of the worst and the best of humanity. You know. For example, in one day, I'm at the Mexico dump where people are living off the trash and the stench of that. And you can't fathom people making a living of that, much less living around it. Yeah. And you end up in the mayor's office that morning. I mean, you know, you, you, in the morning, you were at the mayor's office. At the, the afternoon, you were in this yeah. little dump. So, so I've always had that 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 sensibility about all that and and I think it helped me it has always been a part of who I am you know whether I want it or not it's who I am and it always translates into my work so for me that part has always come easy so to speak because um because it's who I am not what I pretend to be it's who I am and I can't help it yeah you know? Help it. I I try to be that polished commercial photographer, and I can't be that. It feels false to me. It feels superficial. It's like what what the hell is this about beyond money? Yeah. Versus being part of an element, an experience, a moment in 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 this that we call life, mm -hmm. and that to me is our very incredible rich moments that I'll that I'll take to to my grave. And again, stuff that I've never shared with with anybody you know it's it's all mine it's all my experiences my fear my joy whatever um so so that's been i, I think the difference in, in in that in the say the the technical and creative um it, I've, I've always fused those relatively well and the other thing is like you know i see a lot of for, photojournalism photojournalism is reactive mm -hmm. it's, it's a reactive if you're there and you click it you got it but I've always, you know, there's a great photographer, war photographer, James Snatchway, or for that matter, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Sebastian Salgado. At the core, they're humanists. But you look at their at their freaking work, mm -hmm. and, and 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 they're artists. Yeah, it's it's the ability to take that documentary moment and take it into a different spiritual realm. Yeah. And and spiritual experience that goes beyond the literal image right. so you'll have people that are going to say they're going to react to that literal part of the image and then there's going to people that are going to react to the emotional part of the image and then there's going to be people that are going to react to the spiritual and all those that trilogy is in that and the photographer i guarantee you is thinking about all that yeah of doing that yeah. Some some photographers just get stuck in being there and the technical and I got it. Yeah. But it doesn't go beyond that. Yes. It doesn't go beyond being, say, uh, an emotional experience or a spiritual experience. Yeah. Or for that matter, transcendent, which for me is the main objective. If that image is transcendent, it'll live forever. Yeah. It's not going to live, you know, for the front page of one day and then it's dead. That image is going to live forever. Right. And, and for me, that's always been an objective with my imagery. It, it I, That's my objective. If I can create one image that's transcendent and can live 150 years from now, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. Happy. And not everybody can do that. They don't have 
they don't have that spiritual sensibility that you or I that you or I may have. And 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 I don't know if it's inherent. I don't know if it happens just by our upbringing. I I don't know, but I I'm just telling you the way I grew up, and and that gave me those tools, that sensibility. And I've always had like this other sense that most people don't have, you know. And 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 sadly enough, I I see that more being the dominant factor is 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 people are really blind to a lot of obvious things that are obvious to me. Mm-hmm. But they're not obvious to them. And it's so weird to experience that. To me, it's it's very, very strange. It's like I see that in that person, or I see that in that moment, and you're not catching that. So again, it's like we're, I don't know, we're messengers. You know, we happen to have some ability and and that 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 some you know people on the average don't have just the sensibility, this this ability to to register spiritual or emotional yeah. moments that other people can't capture. It's it's yeah. strange to me. That part I feel is that everyone everyone has the capacity, <laughs> but that it's dormant or shut yeah. or shut down or intentionally yeah. blocked. Yeah. For various reasons. Um but yeah I love I love all of that. I love the way you describe that. And I mean I absolutely as you were talking about like the these images created by photojournalists that become like that have this staying power like you know there were specific ones coming to my mind yeah. that have just become iconic yeah um and um i mean journalism is storytelling photojournalism is storytelling visually you know, you want to be truthful and accurate, but you have to have that storytelling aspect of it, you know, and, um, and part of the story, again, it's like, as part of our role as artists and, and, and I, I would include people who are not traditionally, um, lumped into that category. Um, you know, photojournalists can be artists, illustrators can be yeah. artists yeah. you know yeah. um it's that ability to um to t- to take it to that next level yes and and not in a way that like is prescriptive telling people what to think or feel but just right. sort of like opening that door here yeah. it is and what do you now like how how does that person you well, know, well interact with it. Let, let me let me let me kind of share the other spectrum of that. Okay. It's like you go to a museum and you see this picture, and these are by say renowned or say famous photographers or artists, but mainly in my case, photographers. And there's this mediocre picture, and I'm looking at the picture and I'm going like, wow, an eight-year-old could have taken that picture. But then there's a beautiful paragraph on the right side of the picture that kind of gives it that aura and amplifies the importance of the image. And I'm going, well, you know, this guy, whoever did this image, should have chosen to be a writer and not a photographer because the image stinks. Mm-hmm. It's not right, it stinks. <laughs> so you're trying to convince me that this image has these values based on your writing ability and your and your philosophical, you know, interpretation of it based on the image and for me photography is a medium that has to be immediate either it hits you in the face or it doesn't yeah you have to like oh let me read the let me read the essay so i can understand what this is about yeah you know or or why it's important and i really really i i I, that that really irks me in, in my world it's like um and 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 you see a lot of that on and off, you know, where, 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 where there's artists that are pretending to be photographers when they should be just writers. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, it's unfair to those that really, really, really have talent, yeah. visual talent. As yeah. It's unfair that they're taking that space when this guy over here at the left should be having that space. Because when you see the image, you don't need explanation. Yeah. It just hits you on all fronts. 
to me, that to- explanation is just sort of like, it's extra. It, yeah. it gives you insight into like, well, where was the artist coming from? Because right. where they're coming from is going to be different than every single person who interacts with that image. Right. And, you know, it can, it can deepen and expand, uh, you know, whoever the, the audience is of that image, it can expand their experience of it. And, but it, if it's reliant on that, yeah. you know, right. Right. I mean, I, I enjoy talking about my artwork um, and I've actually, you know, I've been making videos on YouTube where I've started doing that as well. But for, yeah. for me, it's not to tell other people like, this is what this is about. It's really, it's, it's really for me because the talking about it process helps yeah. me be, like, like process all of that. And right understand it and like i kind of have revelations and you know i do the same thing if i don't if there's not a camera pointed at me in my studio like i'm talking out loud to my paintings all the time it's just like oh okay you know <laughs> like a total crazy person but um that's an extension you know that's an yeah. extension of you um but but i think in my world from photographers you know photography is a medium that is immediate yeah I mean, we're used to psychologically saying, you know, that's that for most of us, photography is real. It's it's, yeah. it's it's a representation of the real world, which now you know we know that it can be fooled, you know, a million ways. But I think from at the infancy of photography, it, it it's a rendition of the real world. Yeah. And therefore it's an immediate medium. And yeah. that's that as a photojournalist, that's what I grew up with. Is like it either hits you or 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 communicates what it's meant to communicate or it doesn't. Yeah. If it fails, I don't need a paragraph to explain. So right. I grew up with that mentality, with that philosophy of photography being this very powerful, immediate, you know, impactful medium. Yeah. As compared, for example, to a painting, a painting can be very, very interpretive. Yeah. You know, you can take it any, a million ways. Yeah. Whereas a photography, a photography can be like, boom, you know, it's black and white and that's it. You know, there, there's there's not a lot of room for, for interpretation. But that's, again, that's me growing up with that foundation. Mm-hmm. And that, but I totally get what you're describing yeah. in terms of the extension of the artist. Yeah. And, there's and, another and, element to it as well that, like, you know, from my background making books, <laughs> and that's actually something I have, a like, a book project that I'm working on right now that's that is going to be a self-published collection of like some art and some poetry and like so books have not gone away from my like creative toolbox like I love making books I probably always will make books I've been making books since I was a little kid like I would with crayons like you know get the paper and like staple them together and um there's an interplay that happens between text and imagery that um that is also an art form that um yeah it is you know like from my background in educational publishing traditionally it was text accompanying image or diagram or whatever the the imagery was always there to support the text that Mm -hmm. started changing like in the later years that i was working in that field and it and it was especially true for like younger audiences for elementary age, like where the text and the imagery becomes more integrated and they have to work together. And so you almost can't separate them. Um, I mean, you can, but then it's like, it sort of has a whole other feel when each element is separate. And then the, the juxtaposition of them together takes on a whole new meaning kind of like what you're talking about with your composite photography it's like there's this image there's this image and those two images have um have something that they convey and then Mm -hmm. when you put them together it creates something new you know right right and um that's always that's another thing that i'm always really interested in is like what what happens when you take these different elements and put them together and I, I, 
I really enjoy that, like um, the opportunity that is there for that interplay between text and imagery when you're making books um, that hasn't been fully explored, I don't think. Yeah, um, yeah. Are, so, are you still designing books on your own, like personal books? I'm starting to, yeah. I kind of have made a rule for myself that, um, you know, I mean, for very, for, there were a lot of reasons why I stopped working in the publishing industry, but mm -hmm. I mean, primarily it wasn't sustainable, you know, okay. and then uh, the other, you know, tied with top reason was that it wasn't fulfilling. And so, um, you know, I'm already, I was already in a situation that was sort of unsustainable so it was just like well okay i'm just gonna i'm diving in the deep end and doing a midlife career change to artists yeah. Yeah. that is a historically and notoriously you know not a um a wealth generating uh field at least not yeah. for a long time if ever so um i knew that i had a a, a long road ahead of me and a, a significant transition period but, um, but, you know, luckily I have the support structure in my family that I'm, I was able to come be here with my parents and that has had yeah. all kinds of other opportunities that I never would have guessed, you know, as, as challenging as it's been sometimes for all of us to have, you know, and, me and it is part of it. It, yeah, it is part, it is, part of it. The artistic but, career is, 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 that just comes with the territory. As you were saying, I remember tequila came about on a moment of crisis, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, I was having a terrible financial year and I'm going, why did I ever become a photographer when I should have been this, this or that? Or or for that matter, stayed with the newspaper because I would have been like really in a nice position now because I left as a director of photography. Yeah. So I was management, so to speak. Um, and, and, and at that moment, I said, I'm going to do something just for myself screw it yeah like i don't have money i don't know where i'm gonna get this money but i'm gonna go to mexico because that's that's what i want to do that's what i love to do i want to revisit these small towns and see if if that mexico of my childhood still exists mm -hmm. and then, um the the idea of, of tequila came about after i was invited to a blind tasting and the guy the, the guy that's that's doing the um the uh the presentation the 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 tasting ends up being it, it was a blind thing you know i was just invited and i had no idea who was there or what it was about they said oh we're having tequila and tacos i said you should come and bring your camera right and i said oh i don't know i don't know if i have money to do that or do i want to do this come on it's free and so anyway i ended up showing up and the guy that was conducting the tasting ends up being the general manager and master distiller for tequila don julio Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about bullfighting. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I grew up kind of with bullfighting because my dad would take us every Sunday to, instead of watching Sunday football, he'd take us to the bullfights in, in Mexico. And, but, you know, I'm not a fan or aficionado, but I, I love the animal. In fact, I've got a series of pictures that I've been working on for the past 20 years because the animal itself, the brave bull, it's just a phenomenal beast, you yeah. know? And then I started tracking. In fact, I applied. I don't know if you've heard of the Rome Prize. Mm -mm. You, you need to check that out. It's, okay. It's, if you win it, it's like, oh my God. Anyway, it's very difficult to win it. But this is my third attempt at applying for it. But it's based on the mythology of the bull in civilization. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, if you can track it, you know, to the... Egyptians, and even before that, for example, one of the first renditions of art in 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 the caves, you know, book whether you yeah. whether in France or whether in Spain, they're bulls. There's a famous yeah. there's a famous uh, what is it called the 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 Hall of Bull? No, the, the 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 there's a hall named after the bulls in Lascaux, France, mm -hmm. and it's all dedicated. To bulls yeah and then you're wondering like why was that why was that registering in 
in that moment with those people. Right. That this animal was so um, incredibly um, outstanding to them in their daily life that they had to represent it on the walls. What What is that link between the human being, the man or the woman to that animal? What What is the beginning of that link? Mm-hmm. You know, that honor or, or that... Um, that respect or that admiration. And as you start looking at that from the caves, you start going into Greek mythology, you start going into, into Egyptian and, and, and some of these civilizations start incorporating into religion. So it's all that specter of like, what is the mythology of the bull in throughout civilization? So, so I apply for it, you know, this is my third attempt, whether, whether I get it or not, but it's, 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 those images that I start showing to to Enrique de Conza, the, the 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 general manager, and and he gives me his card and he says, uh, "Well, why don't come? Why don't you come to my best friend's bull ranch outside Guadalajara because he's got some of the best animals." And at the, at that moment, my alarm system went off because mm-hmm. access is incredibly difficult. You know, you have to be an insider in that world. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't get in. So. I, I got super excited. I said, really? Can, can you think I can? Yeah. I says, just, just call me and, and, and I'll connect you and, and you can come. So as he gave me his card, then I start, I really like, what do I know? I'm Mexican. I've, I've drank tequila, but what do, what do I know about tequila? Right. And then at that moment, I realized that I'm pretty ignorant. Like 80% of people are pretty ignorant of what, how tequila is made, where it comes from and all that. Mm. So as he gives you the card, I said, why don't I go to your distillery? And you know, do a photo essay. And at that moment, I'm just thinking, well, it's a photo essay. I'll come back with a photo essay and then I'll try to pitch it to X magazine, right? Yeah. Anyway, short story, I end up going out there, but primarily because I was in in a state of defeat, you know, financially and emotionally. And I said, well, I'm going to do this just because of me, because I want to do it. I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm going to go and knock on all these tequila distilleries and lie to them and tell them I'm working on a book, which was, mm-hmm. a total, it was a total lie. You know, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with this. Yeah. So, so I just did it. I just did it. I took off and I enjoyed, it was, it was grueling in terms of sunrise to sundown that that's my work ethic. I said, I got to come back with something. So what happened is when I went to that distillery, I realized like, this is not enough, not even for a photo essay. You know, there's not enough material here to work yeah. with. And, but by then I had done my homework and first of all, I, I try to research like how many, how many books have been published on tequila or what had been done on tequila. And to my amazement, no photo book either in Mexico or in the U S existed except one. And that was kind of like hired models out on the field, you know, yeah. and, and some photojournalism. So anyway, um, I realized like, oh my God, nobody has done anything on this. This is amazing. So then I went out with that idea and I said, I'm just going to have fun on this very ugly year that I'm having. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a leap of faith and just enjoy the ride. Yeah. And that's what I did. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of hard work, but you know, fast forward, it it probably has been my my livelihood the last 10 years because it keeps giving and it keeps giving and it keeps giving and it continues giving, you know? Yeah. So So that was like, a really good life lesson yeah that's great a, a leap of faith a total you know blind leap of faith based on your passion you know mm-hmm. if your passion is painting if your passion is sculptures just go do it yeah excuses whether you have the money or don't have the money just go do it and enjoy it and and that's what i did yeah i love that that's i think that's an inspirational tale for a lot of people thank you for sharing that um well, it's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're we're getting close to an hour, but I just one last thing that I want to yeah. um, say as you were speaking and you were talking about the photography that you've done of the bulls, um, which I've seen uh, some of that just <laughs> your social media, and I think it's like, you know, and then how how you were how you were describing um, the the depiction of bulls in cave art and and how uh the importance that 
that animal had to yeah. humans at that time and how we've we've just relegated a bull to a beast now yeah. you know yeah. um like it is for our use um and that those images that you took of the bulls like are in the in the same way that your um your images of the hemidors are restoring a sense of dignity like i felt that with the bull image as well you know yeah. and and both of those you know people who who work on farms in agricultural um work doing the hard labor like are treated by our world and our society as yeah. something for our use yeah as expendable and um there's like i'm i'm seeing a connection there that i don't know that it was intentional but it's like uh, there's a theme in there in in what in the way that you see the world as that you're you know part of your message is is like wait a minute <laughs> you know this these people these animals these life you know this life um is not expendable and it's it is noble and has dignity and is something to be honored and um it's an important message so uh, and I think you're, you're doing it. I think you're doing it well, you know? Well, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's coming from the heart. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to say before we close? Um, no, I mean, you know, being an artist, as you well know, is, is challenging. It, it's not, the easy way to do things in life. I mean, in terms of uh, making a living, yeah, there's always going to be probably more downs and ups. And then there's a, the few one percent that they're that have their glorious moment while they're still alive, you know. Yeah, and that's fabulous and lucky. But for the most of us, you know, it's it's a struggle. It's it, it's a constant struggle to try to make a living of of, of your passion. Um, but fortunately, you know, I'm I'm, I'm I, I I reach, you know, the retirement age. I'm I'm kind of semi-retired. But the beauty of it is that everything you've invested before in terms of just work, whether it was work, personal work or work that you had to do for for a buck, um I've always kept in mind, I've always did my personal work, no matter what. Yeah. Because I felt a need for that, for my fulfillment as a photographer slash artist um i've always that has always been a constant through my career and now at this age at 66 i realized like oh my god you know the best work i've ever did was my personal work and that in itself is is rewarding me now mm -hmm. in that you know i've got a book coming up hopefully it'll be published through ut press that kind of represents all that yeah uh, all those years of commitment all those years of passion and the evolution of that um so now i have the privilege to work on projects that i want to do and some of them come to the doorstep whereas before i was always like knocking on doors you know trying to get the gig yeah and now all those things are, are coming to me and i have Three pretty exciting projects uh, on the horizon for this year, which I never even imagined that they would happen at this age. You know, when when things are winding down, you think they're actually, you know, moving forward in a, mm -hmm. in a great way and, and call it, you know, survival, call it the rewards of time or or your investment in, in what you believed in, whatever it may be, I I'm I'm enjoying this moment. Of, of a career, whether it translates to money or not. It's just the idea that you're living, you're, 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 you're on the verge of leaving a very solid footprint behind that represents you and your body of work. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge joy. 
um, which means, you know, I've never given, given up on myself and my art. And most importantly, I've always done my thing. I've done everything that it takes to make a living. Some of it is fun. Most of it is not. But I've always pursued my personal projects. And those are the ones that are realistically rewarding me now as an artist and as a photographer. So I look forward to this year. Hopefully all of these projects will get done. And if the Rome price comes along, man, I'll die happy. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a good one. It's a really good one. But more more than anything else, it gave me the opportunity and the funding to finalize this project because it's pretty intense and it's pretty deep. And it's gonna you know it's gonna take me to Turkey. It's gonna take me to Egypt. It's gonna take me to do it right. If yeah. you want to do this thing right, you got to follow the whole you know mythology and religious representation of this animal to now and, and the most current vestiges of that in terms of culture is the bullfight of all yeah. things you yeah. know and i've been amongst plenty of bullfighters and it's it's almost it's almost um contradictory how these guys revere and honor the animal despite mm -hmm. that they sacrifice it right but the way they speak about it in person and in private it's like they're worship they worship this animal I know it sounds very contradictory. And again, I'm not part of that world, but just listening to them, it takes me all the way back to those caves. Yeah. Like, who are these guys worshiping these animals from the yeah. very beginning? What is what is in between all of this? You know, so that's kind of the concept. So hopefully I'll get it. Yeah. And um, anyway, Ken, thank you enough. It's been a pleasure. It's and, it has been a, an immense coffee. pleasure. When I pulled the book out, I noticed I had forgotten that I had a signed version. Oh yeah. And yeah. I'm not going to read it in Spanish because I can, I can understand Spanish better than I can speak it. And I don't want to butcher this beautiful language, but you, you wrote, um, may, uh, may life bring us back together on the way on the path or on the way, uh, something to that effect. Oh, wow. How and cool. here it, it did. So wonderful. Um, what a great ending. Yeah. I love I love that uh, we we got to have this reuniting and reconnecting and um, and hopefully there will be more. So Let, let's let's do that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And again, you know, I have full and honorable respect for the writing that you did back then, and and I appreciate it so much. I mean, really, 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 it, it went to my heart, and I said, "Oh my God, somebody got it." I I really love cool. that. I'm so yeah. happy to hear that. That was very cool. Um, it was so well done. Thank it was you. So well done. And for me, just the gratifying part is that that you got it at all levels, and 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 not everybody can do that. So I I've always been very grateful for that. I I thank you from the heart. That was awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, truly, it's it. so nice to hear. I mean, you know, it's just it's like what you put out there affected me. What yeah. I wrote affected you it was an exchange and and that's that's lovely um to to hear because i i feel like that happens more than we we know as yeah. as creators like we don't know how yeah. people respond no, no, so. and, and it's true it's true but again that's the beauty of it you know i, I still continue thinking to myself you as a vessel i'm a vessel of whatever's out there yeah that's the question what's out there is just it is what it is i feel yeah. it i sense it and I welcome it. And if it comes through me, great. Yeah. You know, we're the chosen ones. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs>